We're in the middle of a summer to remember. And we are considering verses that we can recall when we're in different situations, when we're worried, when we're weary. We're, right now we're in the middle of verses that we can think about when we're ashamed. We talked a little bit about shamed last week. When I'm ashamed, I lose face. You know, spend some time in China. As I said last week, they are very conscious of the whole concept of losing face. And in China, you never want to draw attention to somebody's failures or weaknesses because you would cause that person to lose face. And when I'm ashamed then, when we're ashamed, we lose face and we turn our face from others. Last week, I asked the children, show me a worried face and show me a shame face. And many of them look down and away. And that's what we do when we're ashamed. We feel exposed when we're ashamed. We feel like something that we've done has been brought to public scrutiny and notice. We feel like something about us that we want to keep hidden is now exposed. And perhaps because we feel so exposed, we compensate by turning our face away from people in order to limit the exposure that we feel. We turn our face from others when we're ashamed and we turn our face towards ourselves. Now, our physical face, we turn away, and we don't necessarily turn our physical face towards ourselves, but we become very conscious of ourselves when we're ashamed. We, we can respond and react to the fact that we've exposed ourselves, and we can react by feeling stupid. We can feel, oh, you idiot. And the face that we turn towards ourselves is very critical and very harsh, and we can do a lot of things externally to try to keep from feeling that feeling of shame. We try to save face. When you lose face, you try to save face. You try to do things that draw attention from the thing you, that you did. I told you that on occasion my ankles... I have turned them a number of different times, and the ligaments in the ankles are not all that strong. Sometimes I'll just, you know, my, my ankle will just go over for, it, for nothing. And there was a time I told you last week at the library that I went head over heels, and I couldn't recoup from that one. But there's times where, you know, what you do when you save face. You know, you're walking, and you, you stumble, and, oh, ah, yeah, there it is. Well, that feels better. And I, ah, that feels wonderful. So what do you try to do that for? You try to do that because you try to save face. No, I didn't trip. I was just jogging. <laughs> jogging. Um, what we try to do is we try to live in the light of others' faces. And I think that's a common thing to do to save face. If inwardly we feel very shameful about ourselves, very critical of ourselves, then we try to compensate or bury that sense of being self-critical by being successful being popular, or being beautiful. What do all these things have in common? Being successful, being powerful, being beautiful. They are things that we do to try to draw admiring looks. And if you're aware of how great I am, how popular I am, how beautiful I am, how rich I am, I'm not as conscious of the face that I'm turning towards myself. So I will substitute your face for the face that I turn to myself. And the only problem with that is you can't be with people 24-7 and you can't do the things that would cause people to go, ooh, all the time. It doesn't, it doesn't work. And we end up experiencing those senses of shame and self-criticism over and over and over again. But the, the, the attempt to save face is the attempt to live in the glory of, of another person's esteem, or to live in the light of another person's face. That's what saving face is about, oftentimes. It's the attempt to live in the light of another person's face. And if I see you light up when I have a car, or when I have a new position, or when I have a lot of money, and then you reflect light towards me, admiring gaze, wide eye, wow. I live in the light of your face, and it makes me less conscious of the shame that I feel internally. Again, the problem with that is that it doesn't work long term, 
We talked last time when I'm ashamed. Shame is the inevitable result of living in the light of the wrong face. If I try to live in the light of your face, there are times where you're not going to respond like I want you to respond. And I'm going to feel bad again. And if I'm used to you responding to me positively, you know what I'll do? I'll get angry at you. Wait, no, you're supposed to ooh and ah now. Or I'll get critical towards myself. And then I will try to make you do the thing, the, the thing that you did when you showed me that look. Look, do that look again. And it ends up being a cycle where it, it doesn't work. You've been exposed to people who you sense are doing that. And it's almost like you feel like you're being used. You feel like you're being, I don't know, like something to help this person get over themselves. It doesn't feel very good. But we have a tendency to do that and to try to draw from another and get our sense of significance from the light of their smile. Conversely, the more we live in the light of God's face, the less we struggle with shame. When we understand God correctly and know the face that he shines towards us, the more clearly we know that face, the less we will deal with shame. Now, some of you are saying, time out. That is absolutely not true. Let me tell you the way that I was raised, Mike. I was raised with a God who, if you didn't go now da 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 to church, if you didn't do these 19 things, if you did one of these 20 things, then God looked up from heaven and went, Ugh. And I think we internalize different faces from God. For some of us, God is angry. For some others of us, God is disillusioned, dis- disappointed. Oh. What am I going to do? And we internalize that face. So when we see a thing like the more we live in the light of God's face, the less we struggle with shame. You're saying, Mike, you don't know the God that I know. I think for all of us, we are raised and given representations of God that are misrepresentations of God. A misrepresentation of God is one that will induce shame. When you see God for who he really is, you do not go away feeling shamed. To know God as He is, you do not go away feeling shamed. And we'll see why. And it's not just shame that's tied up with this. It's sin. Sin is the the inevitable result of living in the light of the wrong face. Think about how many moral boundaries and barriers we cross in order to feel good about ourselves. Counseling with individuals who have talked about past sexual exploits will oftentimes comment, I just wanted to feel loved. And I crossed that boundary in order to get a sense of being loved, and it was fleeting. See, that's the problem with living in the light of another person's face. The impact of their glory only lasts a little bit. You feel okay temporarily, momentarily. Sin is the inevitable result of living or trying to live in the light of the wrong face. The more we live in the light of God's face, the less we struggle with sin. That's the biggest challenge for us is living our life in the light of God's face because of misrepresentations that we've received or because we're just plain too busy to ever think about him and to focus on him. Or we have these vague notions of him, but we really don't remember anything about him. That's why we're in the middle of a summer to remember. When we're ashamed, there's things to remember about God. We looked last week, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can we say that together? I'm going to have you close your eyes and try to say it, but the way we wrapped that up last time, it, to summarize it, still powerless, it said earlier in the verse, still sinners, still loved. To sin is to miss the mark of the conduct or the, the things that God wants us to do. And what he indicates here is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And if God demonstrates his love in reaching out to 
grab hold of us even while we're sinners, then sin is not something that makes God go, oh! Now, does God like our sin? No. Sin is counterproductive. It's something that it transgresses His boundaries. But His reaction, He understands we're like puppies. And given the opportunity to, we just, He says, stay, and we go, no. You know, we just kind of... That was a fairly poor imitation of a dog. More like, I don't know what that was. What that was. Uh, anyways, um, so when you think of this verse, are you a sinner? Well, I'll answer that, yeah. <laughs> and while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When I'm ashamed, that's a good thing to remember. Close your eyes. Can you say it? One, two, three. When we're ashamed, it's a great verse to remember. We can know the cod came to deliver us. However, it's, it can still be hard to think of facing God. You know, if you've ever done, well, I could say you've done this too. You've done things your parents didn't want you to do. Any, any time that involved a car? Now, don't go too fast. It's icy out. Watch yourself. And you're thinking, oh, yeah, whatever. And then you get in an accident. And then you have to call your folks. And if you're in a jam, you like to see them drive up because they're going to help you. On the other hand, you don't like to see them drive up because the sense of, I know, and some of us got the lecture and some of us got the look, you know, whatever, whatever it was. Um, we're glad to see the love. We also tend to see disappointment and pity. And as we think about God, we can think of God condescending to send His Son. And okay, that's nice that you love me enough to save me, but I got myself into this mess, and we can then picture God, and at the time that we like to be with Him, we kind of want to shy away. I'm I'm sorry I had to, to call you out of heaven to come here because of my bad choices, and although I'm drawn to you, I want to get away from you. What's interesting... The Bible would have us see something in God's face that I'm not sure that I ever saw clearly in growing up. Somebody might have told me it's there. However, I never thought of it being characteristic of God to look up and to see gentleness and sympathy. If you get in trouble, your parents come. If you see in their face concern, gentleness, and sympathy, that sense of shame disappears or becomes much less. If there's a sense of, and you you can tell that they understand if they say something, you know what, I did the same thing to my parent. And then we don't like to deal with shame. And when somebody sympathizes, it's like, oh, oh, it draws us. What the Bible would have us understand, God, His gaze, His face reflects gentleness and sympathy. Here's the verse. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. Let's say it together. That's you. You say, God has no place for me. I've had my chances. I've come to the end of his sympathy and gentleness. That's not what this verse says. It doesn't say he's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and used to go astray. Does it say used to go astray? What does it say? Going astray. So even in the very context of straying, what God would want you to know, when you look to him, you can stay in the light of his gaze where, because he deals gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. Let's say it one more time. And maybe you need to apply this to yourself. You've thought you've used your chances. That God's had enough of you. 
Enough of the gentleness. Now, what this verse indicates, and it's something God would have you believe, and it would help if you remember. Say it one more time. Here's a question. Why? What are the roots of God's sympathy? Where does it come from? How come it's true of Him? Let's talk about the roots of Jesus' sympathy. Look at the verse in your worship folder. It's on the sheet from the book of Hebrews. Follow along as I read it. We'll look at two verses this morning briefly that are among my favorite in the Bible. I'll read it. You follow along. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. The roots of Jesus' sympathy come from two natures that he possesses, his divine nature and his human nature. The first, it comes from his divine nature. In the first verse, it says, it is not angels he helps. The word that is translated here, he helps, is literally he took by the hand. That's what it literally is. It, so it says, for, the, for surely it is not angels he takes by the hand. It's the same word that we find later on in the book in chapter 8, verse 9, which says, I took them by the hand, I helped them, I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. And that's, he is able to deal gently because as relates to his divine nature, it is the divine character to take somebody by the hand and lead them out of a place. The place then that he led them out of in Egypt was the place of slavery. Now they had done wrong things. They got, they got themselves in that jam. But God did not back up and keep them there forever. What he did, he took them by the hand and he led them out of that place of slavery. Or another word for that, he saved them. And that's what salvation means. It means that God personally comes, takes a person who is enslaved by the hand, brings them out of that place of slavery, brings them into a place of freedom. That's what it means. And it's God's nature to do that. Sometime back, we talked about when people need to be saved. And it helps us to clarify what it means that God saves us, what it means that Jesus is a Savior. What does that mean? And it says people need to be saved when, through their own fault or through some superior power, they come under the control of someone else. See, salvation is about being led out from being enslaved to a hostile, dominating power. Now, that power is not friendly. It is, doesn't have the person's well-being in mind. But through a fault of a person, they have come, or someone else, they have come under bondage. That's when somebody needs to be saved. People need to be saved when, having, being thus controlled, they have lost their freedom to implement their will and decisions. Somebody who needs to be saved might believe that they are free. You know, we, that wouldn't, we couldn't sell that to somebody who is a slave in a foreign country. Slavery used to exist here. If we interviewed someone and asked them how often do they get to do what they want, if we, in, if we interviewed somebody from the early 1800s or read interviews or depictions of what life was like, that person would indicate, what are you talking about? I was a slave. See, to be a slave is the same as saying, I didn't get to choose what I wanted to do. The nature of slavery is that the one in control says, do this, and you have to do it. If you say, I don't will to do that, that's not my decision. When you're a slave, the person doesn't say, oh, okay. 
you receive harsh consequences so that you don't do that again. That's the nature of slavery. And what the Bible would have us understand is that we, being saved by Jesus, need to be saved because we need to be free. Growing up, some of us didn't grow up with any sense of desire to walk with God at all. We called that freedom. What Jesus would call that, you weren't free. You're not. There's, you were not free with respect to sin. You could not do anything but end up doing sinful things. Well, I didn't always sin. A slave didn't always have to do what the master told him to do. There was sometimes, but when push comes to shove, the master calls the shots, and that's what Jesus says to people. If when push comes to shove, sin calls the shots, you're, in, you're, under, you're under bad control. And what Jesus came to do then as a Savior is to help the person who, being thus controlled, lost their freedom to implement their will and decisions. Um, we said sometime back a few months ago, free will in this respect is a fantasy. Free will is a fantasy because slavery is an inevitability. We're enslaved to someone, either enslaved to sin or enslaved to God through Christ. I have the right to do whatever I want to do. No, you don't. That's not true. You, we can make decisions, but ultimately, our decisions will fall in line with one of two camps. And Jesus came to grab us by the hand, take us out of the camp of that which will lead to death and destruction, and lead us into the camp of that which would lead to life. People need to be saved when their own resources are inadequate to deal with their other power. So the person says, I don't want to be controlled by sin, so I'm going to try real hard. No, you can't do that. Needing to be saved means you can't break through on your own. You don't have the power. That's why you need a Savior. And finally, people need to be saved when they can only gain their freedom by the intervention of a third party. That's what God does. He is the third party that rescues you from dominion and brings you into a better place. That's what it means when we talk about salvation. And I think it's, what it, what's important to identify is that God is the one that delivers from slavery. God exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We associate salvation with the Son, Jesus. He's the one that we feel most comfortable with. However, Jesus and the Father, well, they're one. They're not two. It's not an angry father and a loving son. God is not two. He's one. And therefore, it is the father who commissions the son to take humans by the hand to lead them out of slavery. Why did Jesus do that? Because Jesus is loving. Well, yeah, he is, but it's the father who said, I want you to help them. And the son says, yes, father. And he comes to do it, but they act as one. The slavery is to shame and to sin. The gentleness of the Son is rooted in the gentleness of the Father. That's why Jesus comes to be gentle. Because the Father says they need somebody gentle. The sympathy of the Son is rooted in the sympathy of the Father. The Father understands and sympathizes, so He sends the Son to take on human clothes so that He can sympathize with us. As relates to his divine nature, that is where Jesus' sympathy is rooted because it's the nature of the Father as well. It's reflected in both. Not only his divine nature, but his human nature. It says in the, it says in the passage, he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. And we'll go on in the next verse to talk specifically about his sympathy. The word sympathy means to feel with. Now, in our culture, in our language, sympathy and empathy seem to have different senses. Sympathy is to feel for. Empathy is to feel with. Sympathy has the sense of a little more distance. Somebody sympathizes. It's not like they come alongside and can enter into your grief. That's empathy. Sympathy is, oh, I feel bad for you. 
But in the language the Bible was written, that distinction does not occur. The word sympathy means literally to feel with. And what the Bible would have us to understand, the sympathy that Jesus feels is not a distant pity. It is a close, familiar understanding. It is a feeling with. Jesus came that he might understand. And we say, understand what? He never sinned. How can he understand what I deal with? Did he ever treat somebody in an abusive manner? Did he ever surf the Internet and look at things that he shouldn't look at? Did he ever commit adultery? Did he ever lie? No, 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 no. Oh, well, then how can he understand? Um, I think he understands because he understands what's at the root of sin. We quote a verse often. Jeremiah 2.13, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own wells, broken wells that cannot hold water. What, what is sin? Again, Jeremiah 2.13, my people have committed two sins. Sin one, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water. Sin two, they have dug their own wells, broken wells that can't hold water. Jesus understands what it feels like to be pulled away from the spring of living water. He understands what it's like to be pulled towards empty wells. He never gave in, but he understands it. And that is what we deal with. That is what we deal with. And if you look at the, at the heart of your behavior you'll find at some point in the past, we all deal with it, pulled away from living in the light of the Father's face, then pulled towards living in the lives of others' faces. And when we're trying to live in the light of their face, that's where the adultery, the immorality, the stealing, the, all the things come from. But it started here. And we talk about the, it's almost like we tune God out Tune out. We tune ourselves in and then turn from God. Tune God out. Tune in self. Turn from God. That's, I think, the pattern. We get in a place where we don't know if God loves us anymore. He didn't do this and he, he, we thought he should do that. So we start to tune him out. I don't care what he says. Tune God out. Then we start to move towards, what do I want? We tune in self. This would feel good. That would feel great. We've forsaken the spring of living water, and now we're going to try to get our life out of wells. And that's where we turn from. Jesus understands what that feels like. What happened in the wilderness? He became hungry. Remember that? He became hungry. Hunger erodes confidence. When we are in situations where we have unmet needs, it is natural for us to begin to question God. I thought you cared about me. Why do I have these problems in my family? I thought you cared about me. Why am I dealing with this at work? I thought you cared about me. Why am I having trouble with my children? I thought you cared about me. Maybe you don't care about me. Tune out. Tune out. I know what I want to do. Tune in. And we start to choose to do things, turn from. That's what Jesus dealt with when he became hungry. Uh, You remember the movie Jerry Maguire with Tom Cruise? Show me the money. Show me the money. And that's how Satan appealed to Jesus. Ah, Your father seems to have Lost track of you. <laughs> Tell you what, why don't you do this? You see, you're feeling a little bit insecure. You don't really know that the Father is with you. I'll tell you what, have him show himself. Show me the bread. Show me the bread. And Jesus says, I don't live by sight. He says he's going to feed me, and I will believe him. You know what he did? He remembered. He remembered. And because he remembered what God said, he lived it by faith in what God said. If he wasn't able to remember what God said, what might have happened? Well, he was Jesus. He was going to remember. Satan said, I'll tell you what. Yeah, so you got the bread thing. I wasn't able to trip you up on that. Get God. Show me the protection. 
I'm going to jump down. Show me the protection. Make them prove it. Jesus said, no. What did he say? It is written. I'm not going to force God to show me something. I'm going to believe it because he said it, not because I see it. That's the difference between living by faith and living by sight. When we live by faith, our confidence is based on what God said. And if you don't know what God said, if you can't remember it, it's hard to put your faith in it. We end up living by what God, what we see. I see trouble in my life. I see a lack of resources. You must not care about me. And where Jesus says, no, he does care. It is written. We say, oh, you know what? He must not care. Tune out. I want to be cared for. Tune in. I want you to care about me. And it's okay. Care about me. But we're not supposed to base our security on being cared for by a husband or a wife. God is the one whose face we are to live in the light of. Jesus was tempted, and finally, I think Satan tempted Jesus to live in the light of others' faces. The final temptation, you remember? All the glory of the world I will give to you. And I think what Satan was offering Jesus, everyone will look to you with belief and admiration. You will live in the light of everybody's smile. You'll be the new American idol. Everyone will look and, oh, Jesus is wonderful. And he said, no, no, I live in the light of the Father's face. Jesus understands what it's like to be pulled from God, pulled towards living in the light of what other people say and do, and this is at the root of shame. So we say, so what? The roots of Jesus' sympathy are in his divine nature and his human nature. So what? Let's talk briefly about the fruits of Jesus' sympathy. The fruits of Jesus' sympathy. Uh, Look at the verse. Here's what it says. Therefore... Since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He, and here's our verse, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. What it indicates, Jesus as high priest is in a position to do that because he was selected and because he took on flesh and blood. He understands what it's like. That's why one of the fruits of Jesus' sympathy is divine gentleness. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. We related it to puppies. He understands puppies are tempted. They they don't have the mental capacity to know what's good and what's not good. An image that Jesus used oftentimes to describe us is not puppies, but sheep. Sheep. Sheep require a great deal of care. In Isaiah, it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. When it talks about ignorant and are going astray, what it's saying is that God is able to deal gently with sheep-like creatures. And it's not that they might go astray. Sheep will go astray unless they are carefully looked over by a good shepherd. Here's what it means. Being described as sheep, what Jesus is saying about us, apart from the vigilant, diligent care of a good shepherd, you will get lost. Not maybe, not, yeah, that's the person next to me. No, it's you. It's me. It's not some will be ignorant and are going astray. We're sheep. And when you're a sheep, to be ignorant and to go astray is not just inconvenient. Here's what it's like to be a sheep in Israel, at least. There are wolves around. 
If you come out from the protection of a shepherd and are roaming free through the mountain ranges, it's not a great experience of finally I'm free. I can go wherever I want to go. That might be the first thing to hit your brain. But then when you come up, well, there's not much food around. Usually it's in a pot. I don't see it here. There's some grass around, but up in this mountain. There's... And then you see wolves. You know what it's like to be a sheep and to go astray? It's a death warrant. To talk about people who are ignorant and are going astray, it's to describe us as if we're left alone. We will end up pursuing a course that will kill us. That's what it means. And he's able to deal gently because he understands we are moral foul-ups. Given a choice between trusting in a loving father and trying to live in the light of other people's faces, we do that. Why? We're sheep. But he's able to deal gently with us, just like with a puppy. He understands, you know what? You need care. Wait, not me. Jesus says, oh, but you do. You do. And he came to seek and save that which was lost at that time. Those who were supposed to care for people were feeding off of them making people behave so that they could feel better. And some of you have been in places where religious leaders treated you that way, made you behave in order to point to you like some kind of trophy. See how control... And that's not what Jesus came to do. He came to feed and to care for. And we come out of places where that's not always true. Let me tell you about this. Jesus cares about you. Some of us have been in pretty scary religious environments. No religious environment is completely safe because we're people. We're sheep. Some are safer than others. I think this is a safer place. We're not going to try to get you to march up and down in order to feel better about ourselves as leaders. We understand we're all in this together. Jesus cares about you. And here's the other deal. You need to be guided by him. Because the world is scary and there's a lot of wolves around. And you can trust him. Um, he came to seek and save that which was lost. Gentleness is tied to the awareness of the character of what you're trying to protect. And I think there's human confidence as well. When we're ashamed, sympathy is powerful. When you're ashamed, sympathy is incredibly powerful. If you're ashamed about something and I come alongside and say, you know what, I did something just like that. Really? Really? Yeah, let me tell you about what I did. When I did, you know, when I got in the car accident, I went, I wasn't going 100, and, 100, I was going 120, 120. You know, and then, and when there's sympathy, we feel less ashamed. Sympathy is very powerful. In the fourth step of Alcoholics Anonymous, they do a fearless moral inventory. In the fifth step, they explain it. They say it out loud to someone. In the, the big book, it, in, it says this, some things that happen once somebody's completed the telling of the inventory. Once we've taken this step, we're delighted. We can look at the world with perfect peace and ease. It talks about our fears fall from us. We used to have spiritual beliefs, but now we have a spiritual experience. It describes the things. Sympathy is very powerful. Belief in divine sympathy is incredible power, incredibly powerful. It opens the door to sitting with God. We all do things. We go astray. In the faith that I grew up in, I, I developed a habit of having an inventory, going to tell somebody, and getting out of there as soon as I could. What I've learned, now that I know that he's gentle, I sit with him and talk about the things that I am doing. God, why am I doing this? I feel angry. I feel disillusioned. And what I find in the context of knowing his gentleness, I learn what's at the root of it. He describes that. He helps me. I don't hear audible voices. It seems like guilt shuts the door on insight. God, it was bad. It was wrong. And what will happen, you'll never get to the root of it. What he says, he's gentle. He's gentle. Sit with him. God, why am I messing up? 
And when you have the urge to think that he's going, you think about yourself as a puppy or a sheep and think about him as a shepherd and say, Jesus, I am so grateful that I don't need to be ashamed because you deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. There's nothing more powerful I know about God than um, that he deals gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. Some of us are shame-based. That's like water. When I was in China, I was expressing these things, and I saw a number. The Chinese are very diligent, sobbing. And I asked one, what was going on? She says, it was like water. It was like water to know he's gentle. I think you could benefit from knowing that he's gentle. That's why I think that's something you should remember. Can we say the verse one more time? He is able... (laughs) Ah, Shame on you! Or, I'm so disillusioned. I must be a terrible leader. (laughs) Uh, I forget it too. Okay, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. I'm going to say it again. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. Say it one more time. Ah, now I feel better about myself. <laughs> now I can live in the light of your obedience. <laughs> Forget it. Forget it. I'll have the worship team come up now, and we're going to close with a song. time where I was at a prayer conference and the individual leading the conference encouraged us to get alone with God and kind of go through things that were done wrong. And I did that. And I listed, I was good from the religion I grew up in. We were good at making lists and saying what we did wrong. And God didn't audibly talk to me, but I I did receive a clear, firm impression. And it was this. I had asked him, God, show me what was wrong. And then I went, he said, and the the thought was, you asked me to tell you what was wrong, and then you didn't let me do it. And at this time, and I'll recall, this is literally the truth, I had a pencil, and I put the pencil down. I said, okay, you tell me what's up. And I waited for 30 seconds, and I said, I'm not going to write anything down until I think it's from you. And then something hit me, lack of thankfulness. That was at the root of it. And sitting with him and saying, God, what is going on? That's the first time that I'd experienced a sense of experience his, his gentleness in sitting with him. One last time. What does the verse say? Step on the journey to following Christ is baptism. When we make a personal profession of faith in Christ, Jesus gives us the opportunity to express it publicly by being baptized. That's what we're going to do. Well, on July 29th, you're not going to, those, there will be some already we met with last week. Being baptized is not about joining this church. It's about obedience to Christ. He says, when you make a personal decision, proclaim it publicly. If you'd like to talk about it, get some questions answered, right following the prayer, we're going to meet over in the library, and we'll talk about it a little bit. I invite you to come over and get some questions answered so you can make an intelligent choice. Uh, Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you reflect towards us, that you are just and holy, but you are merciful and gentle and sympathetic. We need not cower, kowtow, flee. You understand what it's like to be pulled from living by faith, pulled towards living by sight. You ask us to come to the throne of grace You tell us that you are a merciful and faithful high priest, one to whom we can come without being ashamed. To know you as you are is to be able to realize that. Will you help us to remember this, that you're able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, because you're a good shepherd. In Jesus' name, amen.